Well, good morning to you all. Praise the Lord. So glad to be here today. Let's pray the Lord will bless our time together. Father, we're so thankful for a new day. As you've said in your word, Lord, with a new day come new mercies. And we are thankful for every one of them and need them. And this is a mercy of yours now to speak to us through your word, that we can be here, that we can open your word and learn of you. I pray that you would move among us, work in and through your word in our hearts today in our minds, cause us to love you more and to love your word more and and be built up in the faith. It's in the precious name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, well today I'm taking a brief detour from the book of Hebrews to do what was suggested by one of our fellow elders here, and, and that's go over as an overview the summary and 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 themes of Psalm 119, because we're going through the Psalms in our prayer meetings, and now we've come to Psalm 119, and we're spending 22 weeks, I mean, sorry, 11 weeks in this Psalm, and maybe this will help us and be a blessing to us as we continue on in that, and even besides that, there's just your your own personal edification in, in knowing this Psalm, and when you read this Psalm, and seeing what's here. So today's going to be an overview of Psalm 119. So I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to touch on some themes here. And let me start off by saying that this psalm is a beautiful example of the heart of a true child of God. That's what we're seeing in this. We don't know exactly who wrote this psalm. As far as the author goes, it doesn't say. It doesn't tell us. But almost to a person. My, my favorite commentators say that it's David. It just sounds like him. You've read him enough. It fits a lot of his life experience. And he's, you see he's come through so much, a wise, even perhaps older David. We don't know, but just use that for food for thought. My take is it's probably David. I'll leave it at that. Well, in this psalm, he mentions the heart a lot, the heart, and throughout this psalm, and the love that he has for the Lord, his love for God, and his love for his word, and he also talks about God's steadfast love, his faithful love, you know, that hesed, he draws on that a lot throughout this psalm. So these are heartfelt affections of a person that truly knows God. He's truly experienced the power and the effects of the love of God that comes through his word. He understands God's ways. We're seeing this all through this psalm. This is a person whose deepest longings in his life is is to live pleasing to God. This loving, gracious God who's given him life, he wants to live in a way that pleases him. And shows that he loves him. Long ago, way back into the history of of the people of God, it was observed that this psalm is like the alphabet of divine love. That's how it's been referenced. The alphabet of divine love or the paradise of all the doctrines. That's quite a statement. Or the storehouse of the Holy Spirit, the school of truth. See, that's, that's saying a lot about Psalm 119. The, the deep mystery of the scriptures are here where the whole moral discipline of all virtues shines forth brightly. It's like a condensed Bible within the Bible. It's that impactful. It's that full. It's that robust. It's that thorough. You know, if, if you're asked the, the, the old question, if you're deserted on, a, on an island somewhere, what books would you take? Well, what if you're asked, what psalm would you take? What one psalm would you take? If it were me, I would suggest taking Psalm 119. 
It's not only the longest, by far, by double, that's the longest, but it's also the most full. Like I said, it's, it's the paradise of all the doctrines. You know, back in the fourth century when Augustine, Augustine, I, I say Augustine, I, I, um, he said, you know, when considering teaching on his, the Psalms, he apparently provided a commentary in all the Psalms but one, this one. <laughs> and his friends pressed him. They said, why have you left out Psalm 119? Come on, where's Psalm 119? Where do you, when are you going to provide a commentary on this one? You know what his response was? He said that it's because as often as I, I have considered to do so, it always exceeded the powers of my intent and my thought and the utmost grasp of my faculties. Psalm 119, and this is a brilliant guy, theologian, Bible teacher. And one of the early church fathers called this psalm the perfection of teaching and instruction. Another said that this psalm applies an all-containing medicine to the various spiritual diseases. It's like a cure-all medication for all spiritual diseases. He says it's sufficient to perfect those who long for perfect virtue. You know, you realize I haven't made it yet. I'm not perfect yet. Kind of like Paul, the Apostle Paul. It's for that. It's, it's, it's to rouse the slothful, the lazy. It's to refresh the dispirited, right, the wounded, those that are struggling. It's a remedy to set in order the relaxed. I love that. It, it, it's like that all-containing medicine for the spiritual diseases of all mankind. Now, the theme, the one theme of this psalm is the word of the Lord. That's what it's all about. The word of the Lord. And the only way a person can know God in a saving way is if God reveals himself. Now, you can know there is a God and about his attributes by nature, right? By general revelation. There's a God. He's powerful. He's infinite. He's wise. I'm accountable to him. You can know that. But the only way you can know him in a saving way is if he reveals himself and if the Spirit of God communicates himself through his word to us. Here comes saving knowledge of God through his word. And again, this is the theme, the word of the Lord. So in essence, it takes God to know God. You can't just figure him out by me up here teaching you. He has to teach you. He has to speak to you. That's the only way you'll know God. It takes God to know God. It's a great summary statement of, of what we're saying here. And what we have in the scriptures is God making himself known to us. The true and living God. He's the one who speaks. He's relational and he speaks. And, and he tells us what's good and what's evil. Right? We don't just make these things up. I think that's evil. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. God's the one who decides what really is evil or what's really good, what's wrong and right, what's wise and what's foolish, what, what pleases him and what angers him. He tells us, and he's good to do that for us. That's, lo that's the love of God for him to make that known to us. And ultimately, he tells us in his word the way to life or the way to death. So speaking of the alphabet of divine love, you may have noticed that this Psalm 119, it's laid out by the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters, and these letters serve as the headings for each of, of, of the eight verses. So under one letter, the, it just begins, and it goes that way to the very end of the Hebrew alphabet. It'll have the letter, then it'll have eight verses about or, or based upon that letter. So let's just say if it starts with an A, all eight of the next verses will start with an A. If, if the next one is B, the Beth, it, all the eight next verses start with a B. So this was obviously made 
to commit to memory. That would be a very effective way to do it. You know, we play rogue games sometimes, and you say, let's think of an animal that starts with the B, or let's start with the A's and work all the way through. But you realize this triggers your thoughts. It triggers your memories. So if you also have music to it, it's a song, it's going to be easy, actually, to memorize. It's going to be hard for Americans who know English because when we read it, we don't see that. But that's the way it was written. And, and by the way, of all 176 verses, there's only a few that don't say something about the Word of God. Some aspect of the Word of God, whether it's commandments or precepts or law, something like that. I've only found in the English Standard what I think are five verses. That could be a little home project of your own. When you, when you read through this psalm, maybe put a little, a little circle around the verse that has nothing about the Word of God, and you'll be, they're very few and far between. Uh, so I'm going to say 171 or 72, 172 verses of it have something about the Word of God. Now that could lead some of you to think, well, isn't that becoming kind of monotonous and repetitive? It doesn't. Not if you, if you keep reading it. Look at it closely. The psalmist actually never repeats himself. Not once. He never repeats himself. And I find that amazing. I find that striking. If you carefully look at the verse, they may use, he may use some of the same words. But he'll change the flow of the sentence, and it's a different, he's not repeating himself. He's just saying something else about that aspect of the law or that, that way he loves it or how he applies it. So the more one reads and studies this psalm, the, the fresher and the sweeter it actually becomes. That's because it's living and, and life-giving. There's a man named Philip Henry this is the father of the more famous Matthew Henry. I like this guy more and more. I, li- I love Matthew. But his dad had some good... He's probably uh, an unsung hero in a way because of his son Matthew Henry and how he poured into him and even Matthew's sisters. Well, Philip Henry suggested, take one verse a day to memorize and meditate upon from Psalm 119. Take one, memorize it and meditate on it throughout the day. And it says, by, that, by doing that, you'll have gone through it twice in a year. He said, but he also said that by doing that, you will, it will bring you to be in love with the rest of the Scriptures. All of Scriptures. It will endear your heart to the whole thing, to the whole book. And he he also, Matthew Henry recounts his father saying, All grace grows as your love for the Word of God grows. That's very insightful. When you start loving the Word of God deeper and more, then all of God's grace is going to start growing and growing in your life. That's very insightful. And that's what this psalm is all about. It's this prolonged meditation and upon these, the excellence, as, as Matthew says, Henry, of the Word of God upon its effects and the strength and happiness which it gives to a person in any realm of life. The plowboy, as they, the, you know, to the, the CEO, everyone. In fact, the Christian boy is going to know more, that's what the psalm says, than all the teachers, all the brilliant people on earth when they know God's Word and love God's Word. You know, if you even think about Moses and what he says regarding the law of the Lord and his statutes and commandments and all that, he said it's no idle word. It is what? Your life. It is your life. He says in Deuteronomy 30, Verse 15 and following, Moses says, See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, 
by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, see a lot of those words later on in the psalm, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're, in, you're entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are called to go over to the Jordan to enter and possess. Moses says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live Loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, and holding fast to Him, for He is your life and strength of days. Amen. So with that, you know, he does talk about the Word of God in various ways. He uses terms throughout here. And I want to define and talk briefly about different ways the psalmist, probably David, refers to the Word of God. Because sometimes we can read through it and think, boy, he is just repeating himself. It sounds redundant. But, 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 but that means you're missing something. Or you're not quite understanding what he's saying. And what that word means or signifies. Because again, he's not repeating himself. And he's not falling into this, this er- error of what's kind of a $2 word of tautology. You know what that means? Tautology. Where you're like needlessly repeating yourself. This is not what Psalm 119 is doing. So I want to define some of these words. These words that really are found here in this psalm for God's covenant relationship with us through his word. It says, he'll use the word law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, rules, and word. And he has other pieces I'll add at the, at the later time on promises or ways. But let's look at this. Law. Let's start with that one. Law. He uses it 25 times throughout this this book. Now that word law in Hebrew is Torah. And And that word basically, if you could define it with one word, means instruction. Instruction. Isn't it a blessing that the God of the universe gives you law or instruction? It's a word formed from a verb, which means to direct, to guide, to aim. See, we're aiming here. We're not shooting in the dark. To aim, uh, to to shoot forwards, this is the meaning, its root meaning. So the plain rule is to be this guide or rule of your conduct. One person said it means God's law in general, whether it be that universal rule called the, called the law of nature. He's established those laws too, right? You defy the law of gravity, you're going to find out real fast who's, who's in real control of things. It's that or that which re- is revealed to his people by Moses and perfected by Christ. So God's laws are enacted by him as our Sovereign. Who makes the laws? The one who's in control. If you have a game at home, who makes the laws? Those who are in leadership of the home or who's, who's, who made up the game? You made up the game. You know, this person makes a game, so they get to make the rules, right? This kind of God is sovereign. And David, or the psalmist, often says how much he loves the law. Do you love the law? That'll search us, won't it? This law is something very important because it provides our stability to stabilize her in this, in this world. Like he says in, in verse 165, almost to, at, towards the end, he says, Great peace have those who love your law. Great peace. He says, Nothing can make them stumble. That's amazing. Is how we ought to view the law. Okay, another word he uses is testimonies. He uses it 23 times. Testimonies. Now, testimonies is derived from a word which signifies to bear witness. Right? 
to testify. This is what the meaning is. It's, testimony is what God solemnly testifies to be His will. So testimonies are witnesses and confirmation of His promises made to His people regarding future salvation, your life. And interestingly, the Ark of the Covenant is referred to this way. If you read Exodus and Deuteronomy, you look through all there, you'll be amazed that Moses calls it the Ark of the Testimony. Isn't that interesting? And so are the, the two tables of stone with the, with the Ten Commandments written on them. He calls them, um, when he says, you shall put the very seat on top of the Ark, that mercy seat, and in the Ark you shall put the testimony that I have given you. And Moses even calls the tabernacle, the whole tent structure, he calls it the tabernacle of testimony. You know, these things speak to the, the witnesses of God's dwelling among his people. In the old covenant, that was the, that was the manifest witness, he's with them. How do you know the real God of the universe is with this people? Because you see that tent over there? And you know what's inside that tent? And that ark of testimony, you know what's inside of that? So this, this is bearing witness. So these, Matthew Henry says, God's testimonies are solemnly declared to the world and attested beyond contradiction. They're beyond any human contradiction. Verse 24 of the psalm says, Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. And he says, in verse 14, in the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. In verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. So that's one word he uses, testimonies. Another word is statutes. Statutes. A lot of legal words here. 22 times statutes. Statutes are what the divine lawgiver has laid down. He's the divine lawgiver. He, God is the king of the universe, right? No one above him. No one. No one can call him into question and say, what have you done? Like the prophet Daniel. He is the king. He's the divine lawgiver. He is judge, jury, and executioner. He's it. He's, he's president, house of representatives, senate, and supreme court all in one. It, he is the Lord. And the verb from which this word statute comes from means to engrave or inscribe. The word means a definite prescribed written law. These are God's statutes because they're fixed and determined and they're a perpetual, ongoing obligation on all of mankind. Now that Paul gets into this some. Do you, do you wonder why everyone dies on earth? Doesn't matter what your religion is, you're going to die. You know why? Because of God's statutes. They're broken. So often in this psalm, it can also have an internal meaning. And you see the psalmist internalizing this, Right? The, that moral law which God has engraved on the, the heart, the, these statutes. And like he says in verse 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn your statutes. See, that, he didn't like being afflicted during the affliction, during that time. It's hard, hurt, or whatever. But God had a purpose. What, what was it that you really learn, internalize, really learn my statutes? When you lie or commit adultery, this is going to happen. This is going to hurt. But by God's grace, you do these things. You may, you may commit these things. God may use it so that you really learn it, that you really learn his statutes. And he says in verse 80, May my heart be blameless in your statutes. See? That I may not be put to shame. 
It's a shameful thing to rather, I don't know, dishonor your parents or commit adultery, lie, steal. It's a shameful thing. Paul says, those of you who have become Christians, you once were that. Don't do that anymore. You've got to really learn. Don't steal anymore. Work. And, but he says, my heart, may my heart be blameless in your statutes. See, that's the way a true child of God talks. That's not the way the Pharisees and the religious leaders talked of, the, of Israel. They didn't talk like that. They wanted the outward applause, right? No, this guy, he wants the inward heart, his heart, to really be blameless in God's statutes. Okay, i got to keep moving. Another word is precepts. Precepts. 21 times. Precepts are what God has appointed to be done. Okay? What He's appointed to be done. It's from a word which means to place in trust. Something entrusted to a person that's committed to you. And as an intelligent being, this is what you're now responsible for. You're responsible. It's like a prescription, like a doctor in a way. He gives you a prescription. Here's your prescription. You're, you're sick. You need to take this prescription, and now you're responsible with it to go and use it rightly. You see what that, how that works? These are God's precepts that he has prescribed to us, and we cannot be indifferent or negligent about these things. It will be to your peril that you're negligent about God's precepts. He says in verse 4, right at the beginning of the psalm, he says, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. In verse 87, later on, he says it 21 times, but another time he says, they have almost made an end of me on earth. Like, I'm having a really hard time. They, the enemies of the Lord, the enemies of David probably, have almost made an end of me, destroyed me. But, he says, but, I have not forsaken your precepts. See, he's, he's committed to it and in his conscience, and he's, he's keeping it. He's not indifferent about it. Another word, commandments. Very common, commandments, 20 times. This is basically what God has commanded. He's the commander, he's the king, he's provided commandments. And it comes from a, a verb signifying to command or ordain. It was kind of like what he said to Adam. You know, he provided commandments. And one commandment was, you see that tree? Stay away from it. Don't touch it. Or Noah, he provided him this commandment. You're going to have to build this ark. I'm commanding you, build this thing. And so God's commandments are given with this ultimate authority. And, and they're lodged within us and, and those who are a true Christian or a believer. And they are extremely valuable. Extremely valuable beyond anything else. For example, he says in verse 127, he says, Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. That's how valuable they are. In fact, if you think of Noah, Noah would have loved what he received from God in building that ark. He would have loved that more than all the gold on the earth, wouldn't he? In fact, he would have given up all his gold to have that ark. He probably did. He probably spent everything he had to build that ark. But look how much more valuable that, that was than all the gold in the earth. See how valuable God's commandments are to us. Another one is rules. Rules. If you're reading, I think, uh, King James, New King James, and, and maybe the New American Standard, it has the word judgments. Rules. Judgments. 17 times. This is, again, what, this is pointing to God's being the great judge, the judge of all the earth. What the divine judge has ruled to be right. 
His rules, these are what's right. And it's, it comes from a word signifying to govern. The Abraham said, shall the judge of all the earth not do right? So that's, that's pointing to his judgments and his rules to govern, to judge, or determine. It involves judicial ordinances and decisions. These legal sanctions or consequences that will come. That's not right. That will be judged. You know, what, what happened in the Olympics, we were talking about that a little earlier, about the Lord's Supper and that awfulness, that depiction. You can count on it. The judge of the, all the earth will judge that. It will be dealt with because he is the divine judge in these judgments. And so God's judgments are his judgments, Matthew Henry says, because framed with infinite wisdom and because of them, we, we must both be judged and used for our own judgment. You better judge with sober judgment, Jesus said, didn't he? The way you live. And then God's going to judge you. That's why, that's why he'd say, be careful that, you know, because God's going to judge you the way you're judging others. He's going to use your own standards against, your, against you in that sense. Because So you can have this, this aspect, well, who made these rules? The God of the universe made these rules. Infinite in wisdom. Verse 160 is one example. You know, there's, there's 17 others. But he says in this psalm, he says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules or judgments endures forever. All of them. For all mankind. From the very beginning with Adam... And, and all the rest, everyone on the earth, all the way until today and into the, the future, if the Lord tarries, right? God will judge the world and judge every individual based upon these same judgments and rules of His. They don't change. They never change. So it doesn't matter what a different culture might be like. or what an, you know, He still views it under the same rules, it's incredible. And the psalmist bows to that. He actually loves that and finds comfort in that. All right, another one is just the word word. Word. Saying. This is used the most 30 times. So this is, this is what God has spoken. What God has spoken, His word. Now there, there are two different words in the Hebrew, but they're translated in English, word or even saying, just based on the context and, and the flow of thought in this psalm. I love what uh, this old commentator named David Dixon, he's a good one. Y'all heard of David Dixon? Yeah, I'm glad Michael Durham raised his hand. David Dixon, he, he said, the word signifies God's expounding his mind to us. You want the mind of the Lord? He, you get it through his word. So the word signifies God expounding his mind to us as if he were speaking to us. That's good. Henry says the scripture is called God's word or saying because it is the declaration of his mind. Same thought. He says, and it's his declaration of Christ, who is the eternal word and is all in all in it. Christ in the word. Christ in what God's mind has revealed to us. It, it, John starts off his gospel this way, doesn't he? So in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is, that is a truth with, with depths and marvel and glory that we'll, we'll spend the rest of our days relishing in that one. If you'll lay hold of that. The Word became flesh. He's the Word. He says, like in verse 11 of this psalm, I have stored up your word in my heart. There again, that heart language. 
in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 81, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. Your word. I've been teaching through Hebrews, obviously. Think of how he starts off. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. A word also has a close connection with with the word promise. If you read in the ESV, you'll see that word promise a lot. Like the King James New American Standard, it'll use the word word. For example, in verse 38, in the English Standard, it says, confirm your, to your servant your promise. Like his promises come through what he says. But he says, confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. If you have a New King James New American Standard, it says, Establish your word to your servant who's devoted to fearing you. So there's that connection with promise. You may ask, why are you not going over how many times it says promise? Because I, I just did, but I used the word word. So these are, these are some of the ones I have time today to identify, but these are the main ones. The main one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Law, which is instruction testimonies, what God has solemnly what testified to be His will, precepts, what God has appointed to be done, statutes, what the divine lawgiver has laid down, commandments, what God has commanded, rules, what the divine judge has ruled to be right, and then word, what God has spoken He uses these all through in almost every verse of this entire psalm. He goes on to talk about also ways, your ways. So if you're looking, if you're doing the word, if you're doing the hunt of the verses that don't have something, keep in mind, he might say ways. So include that one. Because I thought I found one like, oh, it says his ways. So God's ways, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. You know, that, that's a big deal because, again, if you remember back to Hebrews chapter 3, he had talked about, you know, God's accusation against the wilderness generation of Israel who would not, he would not let them enter into his rest because they had hardened their hearts. They had put him to the test. And then he concluded in Hebrews 3, 10, and 11, He said, therefore, I was provoked at that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. I swore my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. So that's a big deal. So if you think of how this psalm starts, It starts kind of like the Sermon on the Mount. These Beatitudes, like, blessed are, blessed are those who, dot, dot, dot. That's how he starts it off. So it's very important. This might be one of the most important things I say today. Is this is the key, this, what he's getting at, this is the key to real blessing and real happiness. Happiness from the Lord. God wrought happiness, which is true happiness. That's what blessing means. It would be a mistake to view the law of God or His statutes and commandments as the way of being saved or salvation. Like you're going to be saved by keeping all these things perfectly. That would be a mistake. You shouldn't read the psalm that way. It's the key to happiness. You know, the, the legalists and the religious hypocrites of, of the day, they read the law that way. And the Apostle Paul said that's where they stumbled. He said in Romans 9, 31, Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. 
but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. See, that's not what this psalmist is doing at all. He's realizing if I want to have happiness and joy in this life, if I want to please God, I've got to be like this. I've got to have this affection. It's reflecting a heart of a truly regenerate man, someone who isn't trying to find justification in God's law, but someone who's looking to God's law the right way. And that's what we all need. We don't chunk the Old Testament. Right? We, don't, we don't throw it away. It's very important to us. It's, it, looking at it in the right way is like looking at it as that treasure or something that will help us on to God. See, true happiness and even freedom, freedom is, is, is the key of this psalm. Life, freedom, happiness, pleasing God. It comes from walking with God and walking under His direction. That's what, it, that's what this is saying. Keeping God's law is a means for a Christian to keep their lives happy and blessed. It's never to earn salvation. See, the law isn't something... I think we can fall into this trap in a way. I know I, I'm saying that because speaking from experience. The more I read this psalm and the more I hear this, we can think of the law as some kind of tight, restrictive, narrow drudgery and chains of bondage. No, it, it is that if you're trying to earn salvation that way. That's what Paul said, read 2 Corinthians 3. If you treat it like that, it's a ministry of death. But if you treat it rightly, it's not that. It's a, it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That's what it is. It's light. It's to help you. It, it, he says in verse 165 again, Great peace have those who love God's law. Nothing can make them stumble. So you've got light on your path now, lamp to your feet. And now you're not going to stumble when you're observing and loving and cherishing what God said through His laws, His commandments, His precepts. This speaks of our stability and our freedom in this, this dark world, this sinful world. The law is a great blessing. But faith is always involved. Faith working through love, even with the law. And we need to ask ourselves, do we love the, the Lord this way? Do we love Him by loving His rules, and loving His commands, loving His statutes and His precepts? Truly loving His Word, because that's what we need. That's what we need to find in this psalm. So if the answer is no, you know, I simply don't feel the love that I should for the Word of the Lord or His law or commandments or His rules, then you need to pray maybe verse like 36, where He says, Incline my heart to your testimonies. And not to this selfishness. Incline my heart. Because he knew it. He recognized it. I, I need more. Incline my heart to this, to your testimonies. And keep reading this psalm, saints. And ask the Lord to make these truths real to your heart. And as Spurgeon said, as we study this psalm, we want to feel the glow of the sacred flame in our hearts. Amen. Lord, bless this to your people. I acknowledge, I feel my inadequacy attempting to even provide an overview for Psalm 119. Cause it to be treasured by us more and more. Help us to learn from it in coming weeks. Shape us, build us as, as your people. In Christ's precious name I pray.